How's it going, guys? Pretty good, pretty good. Just um, getting out of work. Uh, okay. I still, I still got to go do another show at 10.15. Jeez. <laughs> All right, we're good to go. Welcome back to the Peruvian Waltz podcast. I'm your host, Peter Galindo, here in Toronto, Ontario. And boy, do we have a jam-packed show. So let's get right into the introductions first. As always, joining us in beautiful Utah is Christopher Viscardo. Christopher, how are you doing tonight? I am doing great here in beautiful Utah. Excellent, excellent. And if my memory serves me correctly, uh, Diego Montalvan joining us again uh, over there in Rhode Island. So on the East Coast, we got two East Coast guys here tonight. So uh, Diego, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you guys? Yeah, can't complain. Can't complain. Um, we've definitely got a lot to talk about. Uh, so this should be a very uh, exciting and uh, jam-packed conversation, I believe. So uh, without further ado, let's get right into this. So obviously guys a lot of topics to break down uh i figured though the ones that we we should maybe start with are up top let's say um because i think one of the most pressing questions following the world cup when it came to peru was what is going to be the future of the likes of juan carlos oblitas and antonio garcia pai and and other directors and much to our delight i think uh, edwin oviedo came out and said they have been extended, uh, you would assume, until the end of the next World Cup cycle, um, which is fantastic news. So I guess with that being said, uh, Christopher, how important was it, do you think, for the FFAFA to extend the contracts for all of the executives and directors, especially considering it was seen as kind of a make-or-break deal for Gareca staying or not? Well, I think, I think it's extremely important, especially – when we're talking about uh, El, El Ciego Oblites, right? Uh, who, honestly, I, to, in my personal opinion, has been the man has, has, that has done the most for Peruvian his soccer in the last 50 years of Peruvian soccer. Not only has he been an, a national team player who, took, who was part of two World Cup squads, he was also our coach in 1998, in the 1998 campaign that saw us, you know, get very, very, very close to the World Cup. I mean, because of goal difference that we, we weren't part of that tournament that year. And now with all of that experience and being able to see things from different perspectives and different angles and having had experience all of that uh, himself, uh, he he took on this role uh, as, an, as an executive, as a, um, as a manager of not just the senior team, but of all the teams in general. And I, I, like, let's be honest, he, he's been key to, to us getting to the 2018 World Cup. And if for some reason Ricardo, Ricardo Gareca decides to leave us, I can trust that Oblitas will find a replacement that will, uh, I think Gareca is irreplaceable, but that it will at least compete and will be someone that is suitable for, for what our needs are because he knows us well and he knows the situation of the of the Peruvian FA pretty well. Completely agreed. Uh, Diego, what are your thoughts on this? I completely agree as well. I think Olitas was the key the key man, the key piece uh, to this whole puzzle, uh, the guy that brought in Gareca. So I think I – think, um, Having him on board, even if Gareca somehow or for some reason leaves, um, I think that he will definitely find the right replacement. Um, knowing what he knows about us as a team, as a player, as manager, I think I think we'll be all right as long as Olita stays on board. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and to those who maybe aren't aware fully of what their roles entail, a sporting director with a national team is is almost like someone who overlooks everything from a sporting side of things so that the federation president doesn't have to or that another director doesn't have to um the coach reports to him he oversees the long-term vision of the team whether that's organizing the player pool the style of play improving the culture scouting that sort of thing it, it varies by by the national team 
But generally speaking, that is what sporting directors do. So, of course, Olitas and Gareca do have a very close relationship. And Olitas was actually hired two months before Gareca. So they've kind of been there from the very start mm -hmm. in those roles, which is massive. And then um, in terms of Garcia Pai and, and other directors of his sort, they're the ones who kind of handle more of the business matters, a little bit of the sporting side too. But they maybe look at organizing the friendlies, looking at where the teams will train when they go abroad, right? So when you saw Peru, you know, laying base camp in Austria and Switzerland, he was kind of in charge of figuring out those accommodations and whatnot. So that's, it's obviously very important. It, it, it's small, but it's so massive to maintaining consistency within the national team. So it, it, it is really massive that they're all sticking around and it does give them a little bit of an upper hand uh, over, let's say, Argentina, who's in disarray, <laughs> and Colombia, who might be looking more oh, yeah. towards uh, Juan Carlos Osorio, but more on that later. Um, I guess while we're on the subject of improving the culture and whatnot, let's maybe touch a little bit on the future somewhat. And by that, I mean the youth national teams, because I'm sure quite a few of these players, specifically from the under-20s, are going to be filtered into the senior side in the next couple of years, maybe even as early as the 2019 or 2020 Copa America. Um, small little note to mention, the under-17s played two friendlies against Uruguay, beat them on penalties in the first game, lost 1-0 last week at La Videna, unfortunately. Uh, a penalty was converted. Carlos Ruiz missed his for Peru, which could have forced a tie. But one noticeable thing that I think was very evident in these friendlies, guys, was... They played a very similar style, the Peruvian under-17s, to the senior side. And I, I guess with that, my question would be, how important is that for th the future and these players? And also, do you think maybe we're starting to see more of a Peruvian equivalent of El Proceso like we see with Uruguay and Oscar Tavares? Uh, Diego, I'll go to you on this. Yeah, I think it's very important because of well, for one, as you said, if they if they play the same style, then you can plug out a player and plug in a new player and lost in the system. They won't be lost in the in in, in the tactics um, that we're playing. Obviously, yes, yeah, some are more talented than others, but yeah. uh, for the most part, um, they they'll, they'll be able to 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 play their role. Um, I think it's uh, very important to to do this, um, like I said, and um, and yeah, I think it's a process that 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 we're headed in the right direction. Absolutely, and other points to mention too on that. Um, part of El Proceso in Uruguay was opening up a national training complex. Peru's going to get that in Chaclacayo. I believe it opens next year. I could be wrong on that next year or two years from now, but it, it's going to be like a massive, massive complex where all the youth national teams are going to stay during the week. Um, you know, they get their classes and, and, and all that. So that's obviously huge. And then another part of it as well um, is that there's now nationwide scouting networks. A, a big stereotype with Peruvian soccer has been, you know, it's very Lima centric, right? And now you're seeing a few more players here and there breaking into the first team. I mean, obviously you got players like Cueva and Santa Maria, um, obviously Miguel Trauco, all from outside of Lima, who are now playing vital roles with the national team and are playing abroad as well. So maybe over the next 10, 15, 20 years, you'll start to see more players coming from the Amazonian region, from the Andes, uh, maybe players from what us, Christopher, who knows? Um, <laughs> hey. It's very possible. Uh, so what are your thoughts on all this? Do, do you think that this is, uh, again, another step in the right direction for the future of Peruvian soccer on the national scale? Um, most most certainly. I, I honestly am a strong believer that anything that it becomes a habit and becomes culture will eventually pay off dividends. Um, honestly, getting getting all categories of Peruvian soccer used to a certain style of play and kind of developing that culture is what's going to help us the most. I think we lacked a culture, especially a culture of discipline for a long time. And, and that's not to say that we also lacked other, other aspects of a quote unquote culture that are key uh, components to be successful uh, at a professional sport, at a sport at a professional level. Um, 
I mentioned this on Twitter earlier today, and I've been actually been just kind of repeating it the, the last few days, which is that the the preparation for the next qualifiers do not start with the Copa America next year, but we have at least four or five different tournaments from there until from now until then, including U17, mm-hmm. U20, mm-hmm. South American Championships. We have this wonderful opportunity with the Pan American Games coming to Lima in 2019. We also have a World Cup, U17 World Cup. And, you know, you might say, well, how, how does this help with the qualifiers and whatnot? But if you really think about it, if, if Mbappe is going to be playing his first World Cup final on 19 this Sunday, right? Those kids that are, you know, 16, 17 or 19, 20 right now could very much be 21, 22, 23 by, by Qatar 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, and that and that's going to be important as our players. I think we have a generation of players that obviously can last another four years. Um, maybe 50 to 60 percent of uh, the players that went uh, to Russia with, with Gareka could probably uh, be with us in four years time. But it is also time to start thinking of other other positions that are going to need to be filled, especially uh, Paolo Guerrero and the fact that. Ruidias is great, but but we need to start looking for someone that can be our our number nine. And um, you know, I guess we already have a team captain with Renato Tapia, right? But at least our number nine and our and our forward uh, for this next qualifying campaign. And I personally don't think that things look very very bright in in that position. Uh, I mean, we can talk of other positions also that will need to be filled in. And I do mm-hmm. like what. Uh, what was said a second ago by by Diego regarding you know if we all play in the same style then you can plug someone in from the U17s or U20s right into the senior team and they should feel comfortable because they know what what this is all about. So on that subject, we do have a question in the chat from Dan, and he asked us, and I guess I can ask Diego about this because he did bring it up um, a little bit earlier, but he asked, do you guys think that using the same style of play may be a bad thing in the future, much like Tiki Taka with Spain? So Diego, do you have maybe a, a counter argument to that, or, or do you maybe agree with it, or, or what do you think? Right. Um, no, I think I'll defend my stance and say that I think – that it would benefit us uh, from playing a certain style that, like I said, you can plug in, plug in and plug out players. Yes, like I said earlier as well, there will be some that are more talented than others, but in 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 the sense, I, I just don't see how how um I think Diki Taka was was more more of um other clubs and other nations learned how to defend that. And while well, I feel like we we you always have to upgrade and update uh, your systems, your formations, your your tactics. I think that's something that that we will have to do. But I I think if we all play a certain way, which we have played over many many years, uh, you know, I think we've always played in in a way that um that we know how to touch the ball, and I feel like we just got to keep doing that. Just a quick opinion on that, uh, Peter. So basically, I, I think that what I would like to respond to this question also is that we're, we're not trying to marry ourselves with just one style of play that we're going to you know, play to, to the death because obviously that is not what soccer is, right? <laughs> if not, we would still be playing with, with two defenders and five forwards. Oh, yeah. You know, this is not the 1940s, <laughs> the 1950s. Uh, the idea is that that when we have an idea or that when we have a particular style of playing, that we're able to incorporate that to the senior team and to the younger categories all at once. That's the idea. It's not that we're, we're just going to do this one style of play. You know, we're going to play it, uh, you know, the, the Peruvian Waltz style from the 70s. No, it's not about that. The idea is that when new ideas do come forward, they don't take – 10 years to trickle down from the senior team all the way down, but that they can be effectively and efficiently uh, applied, you know, within the next generation, which in soccer is usually what, two years, every two years. Technically we have a new generation of, uh, 
of soccer players and that that can uh, evolve over time as necessary, but it is done in an effective manner. Uh, so yes, Tiki Taka might have, have been like a figure out, the, the, the enemies of Spain figured it out very fast, right? Right after Spain became the world champion, the next World Cup, they were out, right? But you can argue that since then, they have once they have evolved once again and that they have done it in a way that uh, has been efficient. And that's what we want to replicate. And I also want to say that I think it, I mean, it also depends on who we're playing against. You know, right, they're, right. They're, they're, sometimes it may not work and you got to switch things up, add another forward, add, I don't know, another winger, add another midfielder, add another defensive midfielder. Depends. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's something that does need to be stressed that Peru under Gareca has been able to play in a variety of different ways. Uh, sure, their primary philosophy is to play this you know, quick one-touch possession-based system, but they can also sit deep and counter. They can play direct. They can play with possession. And that's the beauty of it. Um, and also, just to add, in the game as well against Uruguay, the friendly for the under-17s, there were some players who clearly understood what they were being asked to do, and there were others who were maybe not as comfortable. But in, in some ways, it is good to have players try to adapt to that. Um, and I'm sure it's not going to be perfect now. They just got a new coach in. Um, I'm sure that by the next World Cup and maybe even by the Sudamericano as well, because this is preparation for the Sudamericano, it will be a little more clean and more fluid than it is now. Uh, so it's good to kind of work out the kinks in the friendlies as opposed to let's just figure out a style right as we get to the tournament and then use it. It's not served Peru well in the past at all at, at really any level. So it's crucial that they're doing it now. Um, so with this, I guess we can move on to really the juicy topic, and that is Ricardo Gadeca and whether he stays or goes. So the latest as of right now, he is linked to the Argentina job, but Jorge Sampali is continuing for now. Uh, that seems to be a never ending soap opera every single day. Whenever you read the Argentine mm -hmm. press, um, <laughs> Beckerman is set to join as a director after leaving his Colombia job which is huge because he is very close friends with Gadeca. So you maybe wonder if there's going to be some movement there. Um, and then Colombia is allegedly going to make an offer for Gadeca, but Juan Carlos Osorio is considered the favorite as of this moment, according to the reputable Colombian media members. So <laughs> before we get into whether we think he'll stay or go, um, why don't we discuss a few points that he or maybe even another coach will have to deal with. And I think we brought it up there, Christopher and Diego both brought it up, the system. And specifically, what happens with the number nine? Because with Paolo Guerrero likely retiring in the next year or two, yes, he did tease the fact that he might want to play in 2022, but he'll be on the brink of his 39th birthday. Will he actually be able to? That's, that's a story for another day. Um, but will some parts of the system need to be tweaked to fit someone in like Raul Ruiz Diaz or possibly another striker in the future. Um, so I'll go to you, Christopher, on this, because I know you you touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, I think we need to start from zero. I, th I do think that, I, I mean, let's not forget the lessons that we have learned until now, but if there is a, a time for us to decide to change our system or play a little bit and, and to kind of freshen things up, this, this is it. Uh, I think that just very much like Gareca said, you know, all players start from zero the second that we qualified against New Zealand. I think that the clock once again resets to zero uh, now that the World Cup is over for Peru. Um, I think we need to tweak the system. I personally think that it would be beneficial for us to find someone with similar qualities to Paolo Guerrero and to Jeff Jefferson for fun, especially if we're going to maintain the base of players that we have. The, let's be honest, the Peruvians are short, and it feels like <laughs> and it feels like our national team, unfortunately, is a little bit. I want to say they're even a little bit shorter than average, but I mean, I don't know. That's just, that's just kind of the impression that I get. Uh, but and and as such, you know, having having a big strong forward that that can you know really rise above the rest sorry for that no, no pun intended there i guess but uh uh then that i mean that would be i think that that would be beneficial for us um especially when we're going to be dealing of course with 
with defenders uh, that are taller and faster and stronger than us. Um, they, uh, but at the same time, like I said before, I don't know if I see anyone right now. I mean, we have we have Beto da Silva, uh, we have Alexander Callens, if I'm not mistaken, is playing. Sukar. Alexander Sukar. Uh, Alexander Sukar. Yes, you're right. You're right. Wrong last name. Uh, which are maybe like the top two contenders, but neither one of them seems very convincing to me right now. Um, and maybe we're going to need some more time to scout that out. And maybe these youth, tr youth tournaments that are coming, coming up within the next six months, six months or so will, will help us uh, make that particular decision. Yeah, because we do have Christopher Olivares, Fernando Pacheco coming through, but with Emmanuel Herrera there at Sporting Cristal banging in the goals, you wonder if they're going to get the sufficient playing time. Mind mm -hmm. you, this is you know a year and a half away from starting, so maybe you don't have to worry about it as of yet, but that's certainly an interesting point. Also, Ivan Bulos, uh, a candidate as well, but he can't stay healthy, so you wonder, you wonder if he's really a, a logical candidate. Uh, so Diego, anything to add on on this subject? No, then I mean maybe even I guess Jordi Reina to an extent, yeah. or if or if you can get Carrillo to play that position, I just don't see it happening. But you never know. Um, mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it it is a very interesting subject, and I'm sure that's going to be a major motivation for Gadeca deciding whether to stay or go because it's all good to, you know have this accomplishment and think, well, okay, we can still do better at the World Cup, but then you got to look at these little details of, okay, what I did before was a tough task, but now it might be even more tough because the expectations are raised. And on that subject, when you look at the squad before Gareca, it was very thin. Sergio Marcarian complained about that lack of depth constantly when he was the coach, as we all remember. Um, and, you know, basically like, well, look, you know, a starter gets injured. Who can I put in to replace him? Basically nobody, right? <laughs> Gareca came in and deepened the player pool. And that is a massive, massive accomplishment for him because now, I mean, look at all the depth that, that the national team had. It was almost weird to see it. Um, more depth in some areas than others, of course, but regardless, it was a deeper player pool. So with a couple of players underperforming at the World Cup, and Christopher and I talked about this last week, mainly Miguel Trauco, uh, Edison Flores, and a few others approaching or exceeding 30 years of age by the 2022 World Cup, how important is it for the next coach to give more playing time to those reserve players and be to add more players to the pool, be it from the under-17s, the under-20s, the domestic league, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, Diego, what do you think about this? Um, I think it's very important. I think I think um, with with the older players moving on, I feel oh, I think you know Santa Maria should take the starting position soon. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Araujo will get more chances. Um, Aquino showed that he could play. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, up top, I mean, um, or in that 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 line of three that we usually play be, be behind uh, Guerrero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, maybe Hurtado gets another shot while, you know, Flores has been a little a little down. Um and then and then yeah, we, we definitely gotta look at the under twenties, under seventeens, see what we could do with, you know, Fernando Pacheco, maybe Jairo Concha, maybe uh Brian Velarde. Uh, okay. see see how we can incorporate them. And even if it's even if they're not getting the amount of minutes, just getting them to to be part of that squad uh, is just taking the right step in the right direction to get them ready for whenever you're they're ready to go. Agreed. Christopher. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know if there's anything in particular that I have to add other than, than yeah, we need to start testing some new players in, in some of those positions and let's, let's take our time and let's do it slowly. I think the, the Copa America has a great time. Uh, to try them against, uh, you know, senior uh, players. We also, let's not forget, we do have these these three friendlies coming up, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, and Chile. Mm -hmm. I think those are also great rivals. If I mean, if we want to really, really hustle and get started uh, as soon as possible, then even these three friendlies uh, could also be a good opportunity to see some some fresh faces, kind of similar to what we saw uh, with Croatia and Iceland, and even 
to a little bit of a bigger extent, um, I think those are good chances. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I mean, we, we should be having. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, and we should be having more friendlies if I if I if I heard correctly. Uh, I believe they want to have six before the end of the year. Holy cow! Yeah, I saw that Uruguay was rumored apparently because yeah. they're going to be in the U.S., so that could be a potential opponent. Um, and that's great because obviously with their world ranking going up, they're going to get more prestigious friendlies. Like that Germany friendly does not happen even a year ago. <laughs> no, um, right. Neither does the Netherlands. Chile maybe because they're rivals and they know each other in South America. Uh, Uruguay is also a maybe, but certainly very prestigious friendlies. And they should be playing more European opponents, right? I think that was a, a, a big reason why I think specifically Brazil and, and most of the South American nations kind of struggled at the World Cup. They didn't get enough of that experience against the European teams. Uh, Colombia got it with the France friendly before the World Cup and Peru obviously got it with Croatia and Iceland. But the more you can play against those elite level teams from Europe, I think the better it is for for the national team in, in general. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys would agree with that for certainly because I, I think it will serve Peru well in the next cycle. So... Well, side note, it's just also great to the fans because honestly, I got tired of Peru playing Guatemala and Trinidad and Tobago. Like, honestly, let's let's be honest. You know, as someone that loves the team, it's like, oh, we're playing Jamaica again. You know, so so this this is adding some variety to my exposure to uh, world soccer per se. Yeah, always huge, <laughs> always always huge. Uh, so let's then get into the burning question, and that is, guys. Gareca se queda or Gareca se va? I mean, it's, you know, will he stay or will he go? And and why? So we'll start with Christopher on this. Do you think he stays or goes and state your reason? Ah, uh, jeez. I think, I don't know. My, my gut tells me that he stays. My gut tells me that he stays because I think that if he was to go, we would be already seeing some offers for him. I mean, teams in Europe – well, honestly, I, I, I personally think that from here, the next step for Gareca is going to Europe. I don't think it's sticking around South America, unless it's another uh, prestigious South American um, uh, national team. Like we like we mentioned maybe Colombia, but then it seems like Colombia wants uh, Osorio as their, as their coach. So therefore, if I was Gareca, I would be thinking of Europe. But then we're seeing a lot of the teams in Europe that already picked their coaches and that they already started their preparations for the next season. Uh, so therefore, that makes me think that if I was Gareca, I would stay in Peru and I would continue the process that we have started. Uh, like I said before, even if Gareca did decide to leave, I still trust that we would pick the right coach, especially with, with the good news that uh, we have received recently. Um, other than that, I, I think that's kind of like my biggest reason why I think Gareca is going to stay. I don't see, I'll, I, I haven't heard of any offers that, that would be really, you know, like a big a big deal, even like a mid-table La Liga side mm -hmm. uh, would be like maybe at Gareca's, uh, at Gareca's reach. Um, but also because, yeah, I mean, it would be really nice to see him uh, continue to consolidate what he has already begun. And I think that Gareca is a little thirsty for, for even better results than what he got at this World Cup. All right. And Diego, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think three points from that. I think one, before I had heard earlier on that he didn't want to go to Europe. Not sure why and not sure if that's true. Um, two, I had heard that his wife and his son had said that um, they wanted they they wanted him to stay in Peru, but it was eventually it was up to him. Yep. Um, and three, um, the third point I want to make is that you know originally when he was hired, they were he was hired with the with the point that they would make the 2022 World Cup, right? So I feel like with with no concrete offers now, why not stay? And, and and finish what you started. Um, you know, I, I, I can understand why he would want to go to Argentina, but if Argentina stays with San Pauli, at least like you said for now, um, he's gonna be there's there's no there's no I don't think Gareca will wait that long, you know, and and I feel like if if knowing the little that we that we know about him, I feel like he would wanna keep his uh his process going. 
you know, he's not he's not going to wait that long for the Argentina job. At least right, not right now. Right, right. And one point I do want to mention from the chat, uh, Mr. Raul, uh, Raul, excuse me, said, well, guys, I'm afraid with the quote-unquote legal troubles that Edmund Oviedo is facing and the conduct of, of the judges that attended the World Cup, that Gareca might not come back to coach the team. And I think the legal troubles with Oviedo is a kind of relevant topic. Um, to those who don't know, just literally Google uh, Oviedo and and uh, Chiclayo, and you'll see that story. He was basically implicated for organizing a murder of a, a rival businessman. Essentially, uh, it sounds like something straight out of a out of a mafia gang or a or a, or a cartel, something like that. So um, coming to but, Netflix soon. Exactly. Right. Uh, maybe maybe yeah, that'll be part of. Let's not of, also forget that within the last 20, twenty-four to forty-eight hours, there has been another Oviedo story that has broke out. I don't know if you're aware of it, Peter, see that. but actually, regarding the audios that have come out uh from from um there well there was there's been a few audios that have come out regarding a judge from the supreme court of peru that's been involved in corruption uh other lower judges and also the council within the peruvian government that is in charge of picking judges uh there's they're starting to un uncover this whole mafia basically happened within there and one of the, the judge from the Supreme Court, especially, actually, he flew out to Russia, and he was there for for the Peru matches. And an audio came out, uh, I believe, yesterday, where you can hear a businessman talking to him and telling him, "Oh yeah, I already talked to to Edwin, Edwin Cito, right, Edwin Oviedo, <laughs> and he said that oh, you know, your tickets are ready, like because of course you're you're a big shot, you know, and here like <laughs> everything everything's set up for you, of course, and it's and it's very shady the way that they you know that they handle yeah. all of this basically make it sound like Oviedo wants to buy a few judges because of other legal matters that we might have been involved in. Uh it's all very weird. Our friends at Exitosa have already called <laughs> for Oviedo's immediate immediate you know like firing him you know he should he should be at like they should kick him to the curve within the next like 20 minutes he, he should not even have an office at the peruvian fa and whatnot i mean obviously they've been making a huge deal out of it uh but but i mean i i don't i don't think it's that big of a deal but i maybe maybe that's where our listener is referring to yeah uh, and that that could be change things but i do think that even if obiela goes the fact that we still have the, the rest of the structure under him that I think would remain intact to the most part, mm -hmm. uh, that still gives me some confidence that, that things will be okay. The, the, the Peruvian FA is no longer run as a maf mafia like it was in the in the 90s and 2000s, right? We, we had a very bad precedent of the Peruvian mm -hmm. FA. Uh, Manuel Burga was very much involved with the FIFA gate scandals and with bribery and with corruption uh, and things, uh, at least as an institution, uh, seem to be much better in the Peruvian FA nowadays. So the toppling of a president, if it happened, I don't think would be as big news as we make it to be. No, maybe uh, not. A um, little tidbit, though, while you mentioned Mamor Burga, uh, maybe I should ask him someday. But my dad was actually childhood friends with Mamor Burga in oh, really? Chicago. Um, so, yeah, he's he's got some stories, I, I tell you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so then maybe one day I'll like I'll get a couple you know, of you know what? and I'll ask them. You know what? Because we're both based in the United States and Canada, maybe we'll do a Halloween special. You know, horror stories from the <laughs> There you go. Uh, oh, anyways, oh, that's a great idea. Anyways, I'll just yeah. I'll get a couple of whiskeys in my dad and just get him to spill the beans and whatnot. You know, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> my God, Exitosa will, will come calling me, asking me for details. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, digressing. A little bit um yeah the legal issues might be a thing but until there's something a little more concrete i think it's safe to say that right now that is pretty much a non-factor uh if something happens then we'll obviously cross that bridge when we come to it i'm pretty much in agreement with you guys though i think gadeka will stay um he's got the admiration of the fans of the country the federation as of right now is very well run Everybody that he knows is sticking around. The players have all pleaded for him to stay. That's got to make him feel good as a coach. Um, and you've also got to consider, too, the only real pull that could kind of take him away from Peru is the Argentina job because that's his home. But you look at just the complete disarray they're in and the fact mm. that they're going into kind of like this post-messy apocalyptic world. 
is just, it's probably not too enticing for him, I would imagine, from the sporting side. But of course, emotion can take over. But he seems to be a very level-headed, very methodical man. So I'm sure he's going to put all this into account. And maybe when it's all said and done, he ends up coming back to Peru for that cycle. And Christopher did mention a good point. And Diego mentioned a good point as well about the fact that the goal was the 2022 World Cup and qualifying for that. And that is still very much on. And it's going to be a big challenge, especially in Colombia Bowl, come 2019 to 2021. So before we close out this, why don't we get to a couple of questions from listeners slash viewers. The first question is from Luis Aguayo at El Aguayo 98. And he asked, if Gareca does not renew, do you think that Norberto Solano would be the best replacement if we want to, quote unquote, continue the process? Does bringing someone in from the outside automatically break that process or not necessarily? Diego, what do you think about this? I don't think bringing someone new would necessarily break that process. Um, however, you know, I've been thinking more and more about Solano and I wouldn't mind it. I think um, I think he's he's great with the players. He already knows what we've been doing, what they've been doing, what they've been working on. He's already knows the process, and um, I think he's learned a lot from Mareka. And yeah, I, 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 like I said, I still haven't found a reason why not. I keep asking myself, why not? Why not give him that chance? Yeah, fair enough, uh, Christopher. What do you think? I mean, I think the only thing that worries me a little bit is his lack of uh, managerial experience. I mean, I know that he had a very short spell with Universitario, right? And maybe he maybe he coached uh, some other smaller teams here and there, but he really hasn't handled a big job uh, per se. And the thing about Gareca is that he he personally made it a goal that he wanted to coach a national team. And he worked on that goal for years and years, and he built a team around him that kind of goes wherever he goes, right? And Solano just happens to be the local guy that kind of got through, got thrown into this mix of, of the Gareca, Gareca team. And so the, the, we do have to ask ourselves, if Gareca does go, how many of those people are going to go with him? And to me, the answer would be, you know, those that came with him are going to go with him. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And as such, Norberto Solano then would have to find himself building a a team, a managerial team, uh, almost from scratch. And I I trust the man. I I, I like his character. And I think that's something very important. Like I've mentioned before, it's something very important for any Peruvian coach because the press will eat you alive. Uh, If you were playing in a club, you know that the club leadership would try to to be against you as much as possible, also, which is very contradictory and unfortunate in Peruvian <laughs> soccer. Uh, but, and so having that calm temper and just being very chill, I, I've even seen a few interviews that they do of him where they try to joke around with him and he just kind of just sits there and he kind of just like, uh, yeah, wait, I'm not going to play this game kind of thing. It, it's very funny. It's very funny to see him not be funny, but be it like as sober as possible. And, and I, I personally think that that's very important. But like I said, those would be my doubts if I saw him taking over. Other than that, he's, he's been a player. He he was one of our flagship players in the early 2000s when we were at, at our worst. And he managed to play in the English Premier League. So, I mean, I, I still, I, you know, there's there's a piece of my heart that goes to him. And I think that he would do a good job. Uh, I just think there's a lot of those variables around him. Yeah. And, you know, I think you also have to consider that past experience as a player as being a positive, right? And he obviously Mm -hmm. does have a lot of clout with that squad. You always hear about the players speaking positively about him. And even when you listen or read interviews with Solano, he seems like a very insightful coach. And he seems like he's taken a lot of lessons from Gadeca and the other assistants as well. Um, and impl- and applying that to to his own coaching. Um, and he seems to also be, you know, much like Gareca, very calm as well. And he does obviously know the Peruvian press very, very well, having been a player for many, many years, right? And also playing in England, 
they have a pretty ridiculous press <laughs> over there too. So yeah. he's kind of got like like the worst of, of, of two worlds, the Spanish speaking world and the English speaking world. So uh, he can handle it in, in both languages, which is pretty <laughs> admirable for him. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of like a, like a plan B or a plan C wouldn't be the worst thing. I know Christopher would agree with me on this though. Better than Marcelo Grioni. Let's oh yes, let's, any day, let's every that. game. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. That's that's that is not even a question. Uh, anyway, <laughs> with that, let's move on to the last question from Luis Aguayo as well. Um, he basically had a comment though. I, I guess more so than a question. He basically said, "My biggest fear is going back to becoming an undisciplined team." Gareca did a great job changing that. The next coach needs to demand the same respect, commitment, and discipline. Some of the names out there, like Sampaoli, make me nervous. It would be a shame to go back to that, and I don't think I could agree with that more um, because I think that is the one thing that's kind of weighing on Peruvians' minds is, oh, my God, what happens if he leaves? Are we going to go back to this you know, indiscipline partying lifestyle, or is it is it going to stay the same? Who knows? Uh, I, I think, though, for the most part, the this group especially – is very level-headed and aren't really interested in the in the off the pitch stuff. Let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we can go to. Let me let me just say something really quick with that. Sure. I think the key is culture, 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 and I think that we should strive to get to a point where even if a party coach shows up, the players will tone him down instead of always expecting the coach to tone tone down the players. And I think that that can be worked towards. And I don't think we're quite there yet, but we have made a lot of progress in that aspect. We're in the right direction. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, 100%. So let's move into the squad um, and their future slash maybe questions about who comes in, who comes out. We'll begin again with more questions from the listeners and the viewers. Uh, Jeronimo Latorre at Jeronimo underscore 21 asked, what do you expect the Copa America roster to look like? I would assume the 2019 roster to look like. And do you think Paolo will ever consider playing an MLS? So whichever order you guys want to take that in, go ahead, Christopher. I'll go with you on this. Sure. Um, I do see a few rising stars that we have mentioned before. I think Duarte, I don't know if Duarte could take number one spot. I think that's going to depend a lot on, for example, what Galese uh, decides to do with his career in the next year. But I, I do think that Duarte, with his move to Lobos Buap, and if he does well there, could potentially become number three, if not number two, and surpass both Carvalho and uh, Casia. Um, I also see... Uh, uh, Great future for, for Concha. I think he's been playing very well at San Martin, and I expect great things from him in time to come. I think that he could help us out um, in the national team, maybe to to kind of solve some of the issues that we have been seeing there right now. Uh, obviously, I mean, it, has, it hasn't been anything major, but he, I think he could reinforce us, force a team. And... Uh, to me, to me, those are like the two changes that currently really stand out. Um, uh, I can't think of anything else. Maybe, maybe you guys have something else. Yeah, Diego, go ahead. Yeah. Um, to add on to Duarte and Concha, as you said, I think uh, maybe Fernando Pacheco, maybe get a shot. Uh, even Brian Velarde. Um, but besides that, I mean, you know, uh, Sergio Pena coming back, uh, Abraham coming back. Uh, I think Benavente gets another shot. Yep. Uh, Beto da Silva gets another shot. Um, Suka. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about Jordi Reina. I see sometimes I see him doing really good, but I don't. I just don't know if he fits the system that we're playing now. Just kind of like really yes, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And on that subject, why don't we get into uh, just before we maybe talk about the Copa America roster and maybe other players as a whole. On, on the grand scheme of things, there is a question on Jordi Reina, actually. Um, and Christopher, by the way, thank you for answering the, what would have been the second question from Abel Gamarra asking us about Alejandro uh, Duarte. Oh, so, okay. Well, that works. Um, you, got, <laughs> you got it in. So thank you for that. Uh, and I guess on the Reina subject, Nardinho at Nard Chapel asked us, Jordi Reina's future with La Selección and basically like is what? Um, speaking as someone who covers... The Canadian MLS teams, 
I do watch a lot of the Whitecaps. And see, Reina is an interesting character because much like with Oviedo, he's also involved in some off the pitch scandals of his own, right? With the, right. With the you know, sort of, shall we call it suspicious death of uh, Alessandro Chocano, uh, the young volleyball player in Peru. Uh, she died of a heart condition, but they were maybe wondering if, you know, there was a case of rape or, or something so she like passed that. passed away in the middle of a party. Yeah. Due so, to a heart condition, apparently. Yeah. Or some right. sort of blood but condition. The fact that it was in the middle of a party where Jordi Reyna was at and where there was also some alcohol and some other things involved it, makes it he all. Had rented the room. He, he had rented the, the room, I believe, right? I yes. Believe so he might have even organized a party, you're right. Yeah. 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 And he was also, uh, I could be wrong on this, but I was also reading details. He got her and her friends into clubs when they were underage. Um, obviously provided them alcohol and whatnot, but that, I mean, in Peru, that isn't really, you know, right. it, it's seen as like not a big deal. My God, my, you know, 13, 14 year old cousins walk down the street, buy my uncle's beer and come back <laughs> to the house. Right. So, I mean, you know, no one really cares. Everyone kind of, you know, turns a blind eye to it. But I mean, in terms of that, yeah, that's, I think at the end of the day, that's kind of what hurt Reina's stock with the national team. Um, because mm -hmm. towards the end of the year with his form with Vancouver, um, Gadeka thought, okay, let's bring him back. He, you know, he's very close to the rest of the squad. He can fill a number of different roles and he's playing well. Let's bring him off the bench for 20, 30 minutes, see what he can do. And I think he was maybe, you know, in that sort of outside conversation in terms of the world cup squad. But then I think the off the pitch issues completely hurt him. Um, and yeah, I think Diego made a good point. Like, where does he fit in the system? Is he a left winger, a right winger, a second striker, the main striker, I, it's really tough to say. I mean, there are much better, in my opinion, anyways, better, more informed players in all of those positions. Uh, I mean, just, just look at the wings, for example. The right wingers alone, you've got like four or five deep. So I think it would be pretty tough to break into it. Uh, Christopher, what do you think? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think Jordi has played before. I think he he has been part of the Skareka team. So I don't think the doors are completely shut for him. But considering a little bit of the scandals that like you said, then I think I would tend to agree. Uh, I don't mean to take the conversation somewhere else, but maybe I was wondering, like, what do you think about about Joven from Alianza Lima? And is it too late for him to join the squad too, you know? Which in this case, I, I think I personally prefer over any day uh, over Jordi. Unfortunately, even though I, I even though I personally was a big uh, Jordi uh, fan, especially in 2013, 2014, after after his campaign uh, with the U20 team. But I don't know. What do you think about that? It's interesting to me because you know he's only a couple years older than Reina, right? He's 26. I think he's 27 in September. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've had this conversation before and I'm still very much on this stance. I think Holberg has been, not that he isn't a great player. I, I think he is a good player. I certainly think he's worthy of starting for Alianza, 100%. But I think because the team was so bad to start the year, they're picking up for him now. But I think they were so bad to start out the year and just not playing really well. Any semblance of quality up front was almost amplified by a hundred. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, and I'm not trying to like insult them. It, it, it's just the, the case, right? I mean, look at any club who's struggling and then, you know, some, and again, no disrespect here to, to Holberg, but a half decent attacker kind of ends up picking up some form, you know, shows a, a little bit of flair. And then people are like, wow, okay, he should be in the national team immediately. Right. Maybe as a, as a reserve, give him a shot, especially if he can continue this form. Um, you know, Gadeca is all about giving those domestic base players a chance. I say, why not? Um, it, it's certainly a, a, a possibility, especially when you're trying to build the depth of that team and you can play across the front line too, which is very, very beneficial. Um, and I feel like he can maybe fit more of a role in that national team. So I'm going to run on a list of names, guys, and their ages by the time the 2022 okay. World Cup begins. And you tell me sort of what worries you the most in terms of the positioning. So I'm going to start. These are basically all players who would be starters or got significant minutes with the national team over the last two or three years. So Pedro Gaese, 32 years old. Miguel Trauco, 30 years old. 
Christian Ramos, 33. Luis Advincula, 32. Santa Maria, 30. Yotun, 32. Cueva, 31. Carrillo, 31. Ruiz, 32. So of that sort of, because I basically mentioned what, nine potential starters there. Right. Um, <clears throat> of that, I, I guess of the midfield attack, defense, goalkeeper, that sort of thing, what worries you the most when I say those ages? Um, Diego, I'll start with you on this. The attack, the forwards, the, forward, <laughs> the forwards, easily. Yeah. Uh, like, we, we, like we talked earlier, who who's gonna fill that that role if once get it? You know he's gonna like you said potentially be thirty nine, and then Ruiz thirty two. And mind you, he like I like we said earlier, the system that we play right now doesn't fit his style. So who who will be up there? Who will be our number nine? Yeah, great point, Christopher. Um, I want to say Tranco again. I I yeah. still worry about Tranco. Um. I think that, like, like I said, I think uh, the goalkeeper position is covered, and I also think that our, our center backs are fine. I think I think we we have a promising future with our center backs. Uh, now, Tranco, I know. I mean, also even to an extent, of Vincula. I think those are two two positions that we can worry a little bit more about. I think that if a Vincula uh, keeps up, even you know, if he hits like what thirty one or thirty two, but he's able to maintain his playing style and whatnot, I think that uh, it's not ludicrous to hear that he would come back in 2022. Uh, Trauco right now makes me, gives me a little bit more, gives me a little bit more doubt. And I think that that's just a position that we can uh, work more overall, really. Uh, it's not just about him, but maybe finding, you know, just not one replacement, but but two solid um, replacements for for that position would be would be ideal not not someone that we have to bring in from somewhere else to kind of fill in that gap but someone that's specialized at that at what the position yeah. that local place i think that's something that we can work towards uh more towards and and just like uh diego said a second ago yes uh, uh, the forwards still always yeah. still always a worry on that actually there was an interesting point brought up by dan in the chat uh benevente as a false nine that's probably a possibility i mean he'll be i believe 27 by the time 2022 kicks off and you know he has played as a striker before and he does have an eye for goal it's it's a possibility um certainly a better one for me anyways than putting carrillo up front or, <laughs> or maybe trying to rework Rui Diaz as this like you know secondary farfan who you know has maybe not the height but has the strength um and then in terms of other positions yeah i, I think we're you know, you're pretty well set. Gaese at 32, goalkeepers are in their prime at that age anyways. Ramos mm -hmm. and Santa Maria, they'll be in their prime as well. Ramos maybe at the latter end of it, but even by 32, 33, yeah, Araujo. he'll still be fine. And, and Araujo as well, the backup too. And then you got Luis Abram. Yeah. Um, you could probably bring in Alexander Cayens if you want to. There are players in the domestic league who could do a job like Jefferson Portales, for example. Um you know, the list goes on and on. Uh, Roberto Villamarín possibly is a replacement for Advincula. He just joined Alianza. Should be one for the future as well. Um, like, you know, the, and, you know, Andy Polo and, and even Paulo Hurtado is going to be 31. That's not, a, you know, terrible, at least. Okay. Um, you got some decent young death. And then, of course, Peña and Cartagena and Aquino and Tapia. You throw that in with the players who might get called up. I don't think you're, you're looking... Uh, it's looking all that positive. I'll, I'll close out with this though, guys. There are some young players that could come through. We mentioned them all, but do you see maybe the advancing ages of those players as more of a positive due to the experience in the team and the fact that they will have that one world cup experience with them, assuming they qualify, or is it more of a negative because of the advancing age of those? And in most cases of those key players, uh, Christopher, what do you think? Uh, I think it's going to depend a lot on what their where their career takes them. I think that, for example, you have to the someone that really comes to mind is um, Raúl Fernández, right? Had like a had like a great. Well, he was a bencher in France for a long time, and we still kept him as our national goalie, a uh, national team goalie. And then he he went to MLS. He had a great MLS year, 
and then he finished his contract with Dallas and it just like he disappeared off the radar yeah. never saw him again you know now they call him you know like I mean he's the second second or even maybe now like third goalie for Universitario but you know the guy's not the guy's not very old he could have yeah. he could have he could have continued to be the goalie if he, if his career uh, continued to you know go up I think my point is that for these guys that are going to be hitting their 30s, what we're expecting of them to to seriously consider them for the squad is to see progression in their career and not stagnation or or kind of uh, uh, just like a fall backwards. You know, I think that it, I think that if they maintain their style, I think they already earned the spot in the national team, obviously even now. But if they are able to maintain their style and show progression, then then yes then I will consider their experience and I will consider all of that very valuable to the team, even if they're 30, 31 or 32. If I see stagnation, then I will be more uh, willing to try out younger players, especially to, like we said last week too, also to give them a little bit of a friendly competition, friendly uh, rivalry that will hopefully encourage them. And that will also hopefully show us what, what the younger guys are uh, capable of. All right, Diego, you got the closing thought. No, I absolutely agree. I think um, it all depends on where everyone's at. I do think that we we should mix it up a little bit, especially not not at the World Cup, but now that um, that we have these friendlies coming up, that we have Copa America coming up, just like we did in Centenario, where we brought a whole new squad. Not saying to do that, but you know, incorporate some of these young guys to start getting them ready, start getting ready for the if we want to use them in the qualifiers or, or if they're good enough, then world cup squad. Yeah, exactly. So with that, we will close out the show. We got through a lot. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm Peter Galindo. You can follow me at Galindo PW, follow the show at Peru Waltz. Don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes and SoundCloud as well as YouTube. Uh, it really does help the show when you do that. And if you listen to us on iTunes, try to leave us a five-star review because it boosts the exposure of the show. So that'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, so Christopher, your Twitter handle, and if you want to give a shout out to your boy, Sport Uncash. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome, right, right. Sport Uncash won again this week, seven to one. So they Oof. made it past the first stage of the of the departmental championship in, our, in my home region. And they're gonna be facing another team that is actually from our city. And so I'm expecting to that, that they will cream them also, obviously. So uh, yes, shout out to them as usual. I'll, I'll probably be sporting my uh, Sport Ancash jersey next week, hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, but anyways, my Twitter handle is at v i z underscore f c. Awesome, and Diego. Uh, my Twitter handle is at d montalvan. Awesome. All right. So thank you guys for joining us and thank you to those of you watching live on YouTube and to those of you listening after the fact on iTunes and SoundCloud. I'm Peter Galindo and until next week, we will see you guys then.